In this lecture of the muscular system, we're going to talk about the characteristics of skeletal muscle. First, we have to remember that muscle is a unique tissue. And what makes muscle tissue unique is that it has the ability to contract or shorten in length when stimulated by an electrical impulse. And that electrical impulse, or action potential, will specifically come from a motor neuron. So in this illustration here, there are two motor neurons. One motor neuron is purple, and the other motor neuron is red. You can see that the purple motor neuron innervates two muscle fibers, and the red motor neuron innervates three muscle fibers. We call this interaction between a motor neuron and the muscle fibers a motor unit. And by definition, a motor unit is a motor neuron in all of the muscle fibers that it innervates. In other words, it's a motor neuron in all of the muscle fibers it connects to and stimulates. So now we're going to take a look at a muscle contraction from a graphical standpoint. In order to do this, we have to skin the leg of a frog, isolate the gastrocnemius or calf muscle, and attach that gastrocnemius to an electrical impulse. When we run an electrical current through that gastrocnemius, what's created is a muscle twitch. A muscle twitch is the contraction of a muscle in response to a stimulus that lasts only a few seconds. In other words, it's pretty quick, it's instantaneous. So here we see an electrical impulse traveling down a force transducer. And what ultimately is recorded is this muscle contraction called a twitch. A muscle contraction is recorded on a graph called a myogram. And on a myogram, along the y-axis will be the force of contraction, and along the x-axis will be time, or the duration. When we look at a muscle twitch, at some point, the muscle will be stimulated and a contraction will occur. The first phase of a muscle twitch between the time of stimulation and the contraction is called the lag phase or latent phase. The second phase of a muscle twitch is where the muscle shortens in length. This is called the contraction phase. And finally, the last phase of a muscle twitch is where the muscle is no longer contracting. We call this the relaxation phase. So how can the force or the strength of a muscle contraction be increased? Well, it can increase in two ways. One way is by summation, and the second way is by recruitment. During summation, force of a contraction is increased by rapidly stimulating the muscle fibers. In other words, increasing the frequency of stimulation. So we've seen that if we have a single stimulation, we're going to get a muscle twitch. Well, what happens if we get multiple stimulations occurring successively, one right after the other? What we end up with are twitches that add upon one another or summate because previous twitches are never allowed to fully relax, resulting in an increase in force or strength of contraction. So here we take another look at what happens when we increase the frequency of uh, stimulation. So here we have one stimulus and you get a twitch, multiple stimuli, and what we end up with is summation of twitches. The second way to increase the strength of a muscle contraction or the force of a muscle contraction is by recruitment. During recruitment, force of a contraction is increased by increasing the number of muscle fibers contracting by stimulating more motor units. So looking at this graphically, when we increase the size of the stimulus, we recruit more motor neurons, which increases the strength of the muscle contraction. So another way to look at this graphically is if we look at this illustration, we can see that motor unit number one innervates two muscle fibers, Motor unit number two innervates three muscle fibers. When motor, uh, motor unit number one is stimulated, 
it results in a particular shape of a graph or a particular force of contraction. When motor unit number two is stimulated, it too produces a certain force on a graph. But when we stimulate both motor unit number one and motor unit number two, we get a larger force of contraction. For a muscle contraction to occur, it requires energy. So where does this energy come from? Energy comes from a process called cellular respiration. So recall that cellular respiration is the breakdown of a glucose molecule into ATP. ATP is the energy source for a muscle contraction. Although ATP is the energy source for muscle contraction, our body does not store ATP. Instead, we store something called creatine phosphate. And creatine phosphate can be readily broken down to help produce ATP. During a muscle contraction, whether it's increasing the frequency of the stimulus or increasing the strength of the stimulus, at some point in time, the muscle is going to reach its maximum strength for contraction. We call this tetanus. So by definition, tetanus is the maximum force of a sustained contraction with no relaxation period. At some point in time, the muscle contraction will rapidly decrease. This is known as muscle fatigue. And during muscle fatigue, ATP is used during a muscle contraction faster than it can be produced, and lactic acid builds up faster than it can be removed. So taking another look at a graph, here we have an increase in frequency of stimulus, and this generates a maximum force of contraction called tetanus, which results in fatigue, which is the depletion of ATP. Next, we talk about the types of muscle contractions, and there are two types of muscle contractions. The first type of muscle contraction is called an isometric contraction, and the second type of muscle contraction is called an isotonic contraction. During an isometric contraction, the tension in the muscle increases, while the length of the muscle stays the same. It doesn't change. The second type of muscle contraction is called an isotonic contraction. And in an isotonic contraction, the tension in the muscle increases while the length of the muscle changes. And there are two types of isotonic contractions. The first type of isotonic contraction is a concentric contraction. In a concentric contraction, the tension in the muscle increases while the length of the muscle decreases. And the last type of isotonic contraction is the eccentric contraction. During an eccentric contraction, the tension in the muscle increases while the length of the muscle also increases. And finally, in regards to muscle contractions, there are some muscles that are under constant tension over long periods of time. This is known as muscle tone. Examples of muscles that exhibit muscle tone are the muscles of the lower back, which are needed to maintain posture. Hopefully you understand that when muscles contract, they generate a force. So let's take a look at the two classifications of muscle fibers that help generate this force. The first type of muscle fiber is called a fast twitch fiber. The second type of muscle fiber is called a slow twitch fiber. Fast twitch fibers contract quickly, which means that they're used for explosive movements, and because of this, they fatigue quickly. Fast twitch fibers are also large storages for glycogen. Glycogen can be converted into glucose, and glucose is used during cellular respiration for the production of ATP. Fast twitch fibers undergo anaerobic metabolism, which means that they can break down glucose and form ATP in the absence of oxygen. And finally, fast twitch fibers have few myoglobin. Myoglobin is a protein that binds to oxygen, similar to hemoglobin found in the blood. So in the illustration, fast twitch fibers are the light colored fibers. And again, as I mentioned to you before, fast twitch fibers are used for explosive movements, such as those used in sprinting. And finally, the last type of fibers are the slow twitch fibers. Slow twitch fibers contract slowly, which means that they don't get tired as easily. In other words, they're fatigue resistant. Because slow twitch fibers don't get tired so easily, they have many mitochondria. Slow twitch fibers undergo aerobic metabolism,
which means that they break glucose down in the presence of oxygen to form ATP. And finally, slow twitch fibers have many myoglobin, which means they need a constant source of oxygen. So in the illustration, slow twitch fibers are the dark fibers, and these fibers are best for endurance sports such as marathon running. In this section of the muscular system, we're going to talk about skeletal muscle anatomy. Skeletal muscles have two attachment points. The first attachment point is called the origin, and the origin is the muscle attachment to the stationary bone, or the muscle attachment to the bone that doesn't move. The second attachment point is called the insertion, and the insertion is the muscle attachment to the bone that is not stationary, or the bone that will move. In this illustration of the bicep muscle, this area up here, or the point of attachment, is called the origin, and this area down here at the point of attachment is the insertion. The reason this is the origin is because the humerus and the scapula are stationary. And the reason why this is the insertion is because the radius is the bone that moves during flexion of the bicep muscle. Muscles are typically grouped by their actions, and there are three groups of muscles. The first group are called the agonists. The second group are called the antagonists, and the third group are called fixators. Agonists are the group of muscles that creates the movement, and there are two types of agonist muscles. The first type are called the prime movers, and the prime movers are the major muscles that perform the action. The second type of agonist is called a synergist, and a synergist are a group of muscles that aids the prime mover. So in this illustration of flexion of the forearm, the bicep is the prime mover. It's an agonist muscle. An example of a synergist, it's not pictured here, would be the brachioradialis. The second group of muscles are called the antagonists, and the antagonists are muscles that oppose the movement of the agonist. So again, looking at our picture of flexion of the forearm, We've already talked about the bicep being the prime mover, the agonist, and the tricep now is the antagonist. It opposes flexion. And the last muscle group are called fixators. Fixators are a group of muscles that hold bone in place while other bones are being moved. Some examples of fixators are muscles of the back which help keep the scapula in place. Nomenclature is a naming system, and there are seven different ways to name skeletal muscle. And any one of these ways can be used in combination. They don't have to be used individually. The first way is by the direction of the muscle fibers. The second way is by location. The third way, by size. The fourth way, by the number of origins. The fifth way, by shape. The sixth way, by origin and insertion, and the final way is by actions. Examples of muscles named by location include the pectoralis major and the biceps brachii. Pectoralis refers to the pectorals, pectoral means chest, and brachii refers to the arm. An example of a muscle named by its origin and insertion would be the brachioradialis. It attaches to the brachium, or the arm, and it also attaches to the radius, the radialis. Examples of muscles named by the number of heads would be the triceps brachii. Examples of muscle named by their function would be the extensor muscles found on the forearm. These muscles, such as the extensor carpi radialis, extend the wrist. An example of a muscle named by its size would be the gluteus maximus, maximus meaning large. Examples of muscles named by the shape would be the deltoids, delta is a triangle, and the trapezius, which resembles a trapezoid. And finally, examples of muscles named by the direction of their muscle fibers would include the rectus abdominis, rectus meaning head to toe, 
So the muscle fibers on the rectus abdominis move from superior to inferior. And another abdominal muscle would be the external obliques. Oblique meaning at an angle. 